throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father all restored. And the church of Christ was born. church family and friends that are watching with us. Uh, if you were not here with us this past Sunday, we had Andy Cook with us. He's a great friend of ours, and he's back with us this evening uh, where we're going to be learning about the cross of Christ. I want to read out of Isaiah chapter 53. It says this, speaking of Jesus, a prophecy that was written hundreds of years before this took place. Isaiah wrote this, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom mid men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. What a beautiful passage that we should remind ourselves of in such a time as this, that what Jesus has done, he's, he's poured all of 
his, the world's sorrows and sins upon his shoulders. He's taken it upon himself on the cross of Christ. And so we're glad that you're here with us watching this evening about the cross of Jesus Christ. And may it be a blessing to you. Welcome to the most unusual Good Friday that any of us have ever known, and let's pray to God that it's the most unusual Good Friday we will ever know. The coronavirus has shut us indoors. Millions of us can't get out. It's Easter weekend, and we can't even celebrate with our church family and with our loved ones. Uh, what a different, different kind of experience this is. We never saw it coming. We don't ever want to see it again, and we pray that it will be over very, very quickly. But thank you for joining us on this Good Friday for this presentation. My name is Andy Cook, and I take people to Israel. Sometimes we actually get on an airplane and fly there and get out and walk along the ground, and I'm looking forward to doing that again. Most of the time, though, I lead what you might call a virtual tour, a virtual tour experience where we try to understand some of the secrets that the land of the Bible can give us in understanding some of the most familiar passages in the Bible. And I know you know the story of Good Friday, how Jesus died on the cross. It sets up uh, an incredible celebration for Sunday of the resurrection. But the land can help us understand this story in a brand new way. And so what I'd like you to do is, is come with me as we, we go to Jerusalem. If you're stuck inside, can't leave your house, why not go to Israel? We'll come to the Mount of Olives and walk down that mountain as if we could see Jesus riding on that donkey as he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. You know, he intentionally chose a donkey for that entrance. And people saw it. They were cheering. They were, they were just going crazy as if a hero had come to town, as if a new king had come to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, the word Christ can mean king. And Jesus certainly acted like he was in charge. He goes into the Temple Mount area and he overturns the tables of the, the money changers and he drives out the sacrificial animals and, and everything was quiet for a while. And right there at the beginning of Passover week, there was actually a day when worship was unhindered by all, the, all of that noise, all the smell, all the distractions. Now, as we tour Jerusalem, I'd like you to pay attention to the things you hear as much as to what you see. For on Good Friday, there's something Jesus said that he desperately wanted us to hear. He laid out all the clues. He, he gave it to us very, very clearly, but we don't always have ears to hear. And if you're like me, you didn't grow up Jewish. I, I'm what the Bible would call a, a Gentile. It might be helpful to remember that Jesus could talk to his Jewish followers of that time period almost in a secret language. I'm not talking about Hebrew or Aramaic. I'm, I'm talking about the Scripture. They didn't have a printed copy of the Bible with them. Nothing like that existed. Um, there weren't even chapter numbers inside the different books of the Bible, as we would call it. They're Jewish scriptures. We, Christians tend to say the Old Testament. That's something, if you wanted a personal copy, you had to memorize it. And Jesus could talk to his followers in, in, by simply quoting scripture. And when I hear Matthew chapter 11, I just hear something that Jesus said. But his listeners, those Jewish listeners, actually heard something from Jeremiah the prophet. Because Jeremiah had said, if you will look for the good way, the ancient way, you will finally find that thing that will fill you up, the thing that will satisfy you. You will find what Jeremiah called rest for your soul, that ultimate rest. And Jesus, audaciously, some would say, said, well, the key is to come to me. Listen to me. Learn from me. It, it, it doesn't sound too radical to us, but I would remind you that there were some who heard Jesus say things like this, and they decided he needed to die. Well, here's another example. Jesus is riding on the ground in the dust. Now, you know this story probably. There had been a woman caught in adultery. They brought her to Jesus as a trap. They, they asked Jesus, why don't you decide for us? The law says she needs to die for her sin. What do you say? 
in his response, he started writing on the ground. What's going on with this? We've always wanted to know what's Jesus writing. Maybe the names of different individuals. Maybe a, something that happened that one of them would be embarrassed about. Maybe, a, maybe an ancient website that someone shouldn't have been visiting. I don't know. But no, the people in Jesus' audience, listening with those ears that heard this, what I'm calling kind of a secret language, they raced through their minds going, where in Scripture does someone write in the dust? And the answer is from Jeremiah the prophet again. It's a scalding rebuke of people who've taken advantage of others, especially if they've taken advantage of others financially. And the men who had brought this woman to Jesus had done exactly that. All of these people coming from all over Israel, they were poor. They didn't have much money, and they were cheating them in the exchange rate for the temple tax and for the temple offerings. They had gotten rich at the expense of people who had come to worship God. Jesus, by riding in the dust, drawing their attention to this passage... Listen, if I write your name in the dust, it's no big deal. But if God writes your name in the dust and the wind blows, you are blown away forever. And as soon as they got to the passage Jesus was pointing them to, they left. They knew he had them because this woman was not the only sinner in the circle who deserved to die. Well, there's one other case that we've already mentioned. We could mention three dozen cases, but just these three. When Jesus had that donkey and he rides down the mountain... All of the people there remembered that the prophet Zechariah had said, The day will come, Jerusalem, when your king will come to you on a donkey. The word Christ can mean king. Jesus the Christ. Pilate introduces Jesus. Behold your king, even the sign above his head, the king of the Jews. Jesus comes into town on the first day of Passover week. He makes a grand, glorious, visible entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey, and they all got the message because they all knew the Scripture. They all remembered that when David had made his son Solomon king, he had put Solomon on his donkey, and Solomon made a glorious entrance into Jerusalem. From that day forth, all the kings of Jerusalem came in on a donkey. It was very symbolic what Jesus was doing. And frankly, he acted like he was in charge, clearing the temple of all the money changers. From the Mount of Olives, the week began to play out and things, in a sense, calmed down a little bit. Until you get to the last night of the life of Jesus, he has the Passover meal with his disciples, and then he goes to the base of the Mount of Olives. And if you cross the Kidron Valley. You leave the old city of Jerusalem. On the other side, on the, on the eastern side of the Temple Mount is the Kidron Valley. John says we cross the Kidron going into Gethsemane. And Gethsemane is going to be at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. And this is where Jesus would pray. This is where Jesus would ask the Father if there was another way. Possibly, please let there be another way. But eventually he said, not my will, but yours be done. And some of those old ancient olive trees are still there today. Um, and and you, can, you can visualize all that happened there as Judas came around the corner with a small army. And Jesus was arrested. There was a brief fight. And he's unfairly tried. And then he's, he's scourged. He's tortured. And finally, he's crucified. In Jerusalem today, there are two potential locations for the crucifixion. I'll, I'll take you to both of those locations, being sure to tell you that we're not quite sure if either one of them is correct or which one might be correct, but most scholars say it's going to be in what's called now the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. By tradition, we're going to go see the place where Jesus was crucified, where he was laid in a tomb or a sepulchre, and then raised to new life, to life again on the third day. And you do that by getting on the Via Dolorosa, that's a very famous street in Jerusalem today. Thousands of Christian pilgrims are walking that way almost every day when Jerusalem is open. Um, and you come to a normal Easter weekend, tens of thousands of people will pack these streets. I need to tell you that this Via Dolorosa is not the road that Jesus walked. In fact, these stones are only about 500 years old. And in a city that has history dating back more than 3,000 years. 500 years is not that old. Now, there are places where you can see some stones that Jesus would have known, but you have to go underneath the streets. 
You have to use the work of archaeologists who've gone down. They, they dig down in the layers of civilizations. These ancient cities always get taller as people rebuild after war or earthquakes, um, after fire destroys the buildings. They knock down what has to be knocked down, and they build new on top of it. And so you go down, and in this particular location, we're going underneath the, the Sisters of Zion Convent. And there on the floor, you can see some stones that date back to the first century. And these stones are very, very close to where Jesus was tried by Pilate and tortured by the soldiers before being led down a road that would have indeed been a way of suffering. That's what the Via Dolorosa means until they got to the place of the crucifixion. Now, an ancient church stands over the traditional location of the crucifixion. In fact, six Christian denominations led by the Greek Orthodox Church share control of this Church of the Holy Sepulchre. If you happen to be looking for a hill far away where the cross once stood, you'll not be able to find it in this church. For every inch of the property seems to be covered with icons, sacred spaces, altars, the scent of candle wax and incense is very heavy, and it's easy to get lost in a maze of rotundas and hallways and stairways and, of course, people. Now, scholars assure us that underneath this church floor are the remnants of a stone quarry, and apparently part of the quarry once looked like a skull, perhaps some stone that was left exposed, and it was there that Jesus was crucified. And if you look carefully... You'll even see evidence of the quarry that the church builders covered up. Thankfully, there's another location nearby that hasn't been covered up by a church, and it's easier to visualize here what that rock quarry underneath the church might have looked like. It's just a short distance away from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Via Dolorosa. Exit the old city at the Damascus Gate, cross the street, and look for a bus station. If you'll look behind that bus station, you'll find the remnant of another ancient rock quarry. What the stonemasons left behind centuries ago was a hill made up of small rocks. Nothing in this hill was worth the work, so they stopped digging for large stones here. The small stones of this cliff were, therefore, stones the builders rejected. A man named Charles Gordon drew so much attention to this hill in the late 1800s, it became known as Gordon's Calvary. Indeed, it does bear the resemblance of a skull. Charles Gordon became convinced that this was the actual Golgotha, the place of Jesus' crucifixion. I wouldn't tell you that this is the location of where Jesus was crucified, but it certainly is an amazing location to, to say, hey, let's remember what happened here. And let's remember what Jesus had to say here, because that's really what's important. Not the particular place. Somewhere near here, Jesus was crucified. You could have walked there in a matter of a minute or two, wherever it was, wherever the location was. But Jesus said seven things on the cross. The very first thing that he would say to, to people who had just crucified him is, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He asked John to take care of his mother, and, and indeed he did for the rest of her life. He said to a criminal who was being crucified right next to him, a man who professed faith in Jesus at the very last moment, who expressed hope that Jesus had the answer. He said, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. They were both going to die that day, and Jesus, in a sense, says, because of your faith in me, I, you will be together at the end of this day in, in paradise. Powerful thing. Now listen to me. The next four things that Jesus is going to say while he is on the cross, all are quotations of Scripture. And remember that anyone around the cross who was not Jewish would not understand that Jesus, the rabbi who always used Scripture to teach, was indeed teaching a final lesson to those who would listen. He said, for instance, I am thirsty. I thirst. Now, John, who is Jewish, who was there, writes it this way, knowing that the Scripture must be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. He made the connection. Now, there is indeed a psalm that says, I thirst, but there's also another reference to a man dying of thirst in the middle of Psalm 22. That man said, my mouth is dried up like potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Jesus also said from the cross, 
It is finished. Tetelestai in the Greek language. But it is finished may be a reference to the very last line of Psalm 22, which would make it a second reference to the 22nd Psalm. He has done it. And that's the conclusion of the psalm. The bookend would be the first line of the psalm. But hold on to that thought just for a second, because Jesus also said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is a direct quotation of Psalm 31, verse 5. It happens to be that at 3 o'clock every afternoon, those who were in the temple as they saw the evening sacrifice being given quoted together this line from the 31st Psalm, Into your hands I commit my spirit. It's as if we're saying it's the end of the day. If this happens to have been my last day, if, if I die while I sleep, then into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus may have been joining the community in worship on his last day, and he quoted the same line that was being quoted in the temple at 3 p.m. And the reason those around the cross knew it was 3 is the trumpets had blown in a special place so that all of Jerusalem would know a lamb had just died for the sins of all the people who would accept the gift. And then there is that most troubling statement from the cross. As Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you know, all the Gentiles around the cross heard a cry of great grief. And all of the Gentiles who've written all the theology and the ideas about what was going on here ever since that day have wondered if Jesus gave up or he realized the whole thing had been a mistake. And and it all, there was no miracle in in the agony of his soul. That was it. It's all over. God, why have you forsaken me? Now, you can connect at times in your life with a pain so deep that you can feel forsaken, and that's a different sermon for a different day. I want you to hear what Jewish people heard as Jesus said this, because they heard the first line of Psalm 22. They heard Jesus, the rabbi, who always taught with Scripture, and when he wanted them to hear the Scripture... He simply quoted the first line of the passage. And so there's Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea at the foot of the cross, along with John and Mary Magdalene and some others. They're all Jewish. They race in their minds wondering, okay, what does Psalm 22 say? What does Psalm 22 say? Because clearly Jesus wants me to hear this. With his last breath, he's teaching us one more time. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the sound of my groaning? I call to you by day, you do not answer. By night, I'm not silent. Yet you were enthroned as the Holy One. You were the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They, they called out to you, you answered them. They cried to you, you delivered them. In you they put their trust and they were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man. I'm scorned by all the people, despised by all men. All who see me mock me. They, they shake their heads. They wag their tongues as they pass by. They say, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord save him. Let the Lord deliver him since he delights in him. But you called me forth from my mother's womb. From my mother's breast, you made me trust in you. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Oh, come quickly to save me. For trouble is near and there is no one to help. Bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Warring lions that, that, that open their mouths wide against their prey have opened their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My mouth is dried up like potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. For you have laid me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A band of evil men encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. All of my bones are on display. 
people stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothing among themselves. They cast lots for my garment. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to save me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of these dogs. Rescue me from the mouths of lions. Save me from the horns of wild oxen. And I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. All you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of his afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. He has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before, before those who fear the Lord, I will yet fulfill my vows. The, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will find Him. Oh, may your hearts live forever. And the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of all the nations will bow down before Him. For dominion belongs to our God and He reigns over the nations. The rich will feast and worship. Those who go down to the dust will kneel before Him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. And posterity will serve Him. Future generations will be told of the Lord. They will, they will tell people yet unborn of His righteousness, for He has done it. And with that, it looked like the Jesus story was over. I mean, nobody at the Nobody at the cross as Joseph and Nicodemus received that body and began to treat it lovingly and prepare it for burial. Nobody ever thought they would see Jesus alive. It's a, it's a wonder we call it Good Friday, such a horrible day. And, and, and they wrapped the body of Jesus, prepared it for burial, put it in that tomb, then sealed the stone in front of it. And they walked away as the sun went down, never dreaming in their wildest dreams that this story was indeed not yet finished. <laughs> as the old preacher loved to say, it is Friday. Dark, horrible day that it is. No kidding, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. On this particular Easter weekend, Churches all around the world will have to be closed because of a, a virus that's causing us to shut down for a season. It's created great fear and anxiety all over the world. And yet, on this Easter weekend, nothing stops us from celebrating the truth of all truths, that death is not the end of the story. You know, whether it's the COVID-19 virus that takes my life or your life, the truth is, one day, Time's going to run out and our lives will end. Do you understand the power of the empty tomb? Do you understand what happened there as Jesus made us focus on Psalm 22? This was no accident. This was not a terrible political story gone bad. This was the plan from the very beginning. Those words written by David is like an oil painting of the cross. And it has caused people to realize that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Lamb of God dying for the sins of the world for all, for all who would accept the gift. And if you accept the gift, one day somebody's going to put your body, probably not in a tomb with a rolling stone, but they'll, they'll do something with your body. But can you hear the promise that man on the cross heard? That Jesus said, if you'll just follow me into your own death, you'll have the same victory that I had over death. The, uh, the resurrection was proof that there's life after death as long as you follow me. And if that's a message you resonate with today, maybe even for the first time, then yes, this really is a Good Friday. A very, very Good Friday indeed. I gotta thank you for the hope that is ours through Jesus. I thank you 
for the power of the cross and for the truth of the resurrection and for the difference it's made in the lives of billions of people for centuries and for the, li and for the difference it's making in our lives today. And we're going to trust you with everything that happens to us. This crisis on this particular weekend or whatever the next crisis might be. Because we know that sooner or later our lives will come to an end and that because of the incredible sacrificial death of Jesus and the power of the resurrection that followed, that we don't have to be afraid of death, that it's not the end of our story any more than it was the end of Jesus' story. Thank you so much for that incredible truth and thank you for our time together today. We love you so much. You've been so very good to us. We thank you in Jesus' name.